welcome to the and Lauren podcast series, a series that focuses exclusively on patients now referred to as having nano rare mutations. I'm Stan Crook, and I'm the founder, chairman, and CEO of Enlorum. Enlorum is a nonprofit foundation that I initiated in January of 2020. Our mission at Enlorum is to take advantage of the technology we created at Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Anisense Technology, or ASO Technology, to discover, develop, and provide experimental ASO treatments to nanorail patients, and to do that for free for life. In a previous chat, I told you that the cardiovascular system is made up of a pump, the heart, two sets of pipes, the arteries and veins, a spigot, the kidney, and fluid, blood. Then I focused on how blood delivers oxygen and nutrients to tissues and then removes carbon dioxide and waste from those same tissues. Next, I described how blood manages to flow smoothly and easily, and yet can rapidly respond to plug holes in blood vessels. Today, we'll focus on the pump, the heart. Uh, In fact, I think uh, we'll probably have to divide this into two uh, podcasts uh, because the heart, as you might expect, is pretty complex. Of course, you already know that the pump is the heart. I imagine that you know that the heart is two-sided and has four chambers, the right atrium and the right ventricle, the left atrium and left ventricle. But have you ever asked why you have two-sided heart or why heart attacks always seem to happen in the left ventricle? The answer is simple. You have two circulatory systems and these systems are very, very different. The pulmonary or lung circulatory system is managed by the right side of the heart and is a very low pressure, low flow system. The peripheral circulatory system or the circulatory system that supplies blood to all of the peripheral tissues is managed by the left side of the heart and is a high pressure, rapid flow system. Since the systemic uh, circulation of blood requires high blood pressure, the left side of the heart, specifically the left ventricle, does most of the work that the heart does. And the left ventricle, therefore, is the most sensitive to any change in the supply of blood, or said another way, oxygen and nutrients. So the heart attacks almost always happen in the left ventricle because that's where you have the use of most energy and the most force being contracted by the muscle. Why does your heart have atria and ventricles? Again, the answer is really simple. The atria are used as reservoirs for blood to then be used to assure that the ventricles are filled before every beat of your heart. The atria then are fillers of the ventricle and the ventricles then are the true big pumps of the heart. Okay, let's look at the right side of the heart. The venous system collects blood depleted of oxygen and nutrients and rich in carbon dioxide and waste from peripheral tissues. All the used blood eventually enters a large vein, the inferior vena cava. It's called vena cava because it's by far the biggest vein and it's called inferior not because it's less worthy but because it enters the right atrium from below. The inferior vena cava delivers blood to the right atrium. Every time your heart beats, the right atrium fills the right ventricle. The right ventricle then empties into the pulmonary artery. Now the venous system is a low pressure system. Normal pressure in the inferior vena cava is around three to eight millimeters of mercury. The pressure in the pulmonary artery is also low, typically three to eight millimeters of mercury. Why low pressure? Why low flow? Because you want blood to flow through the lung very slowly to allow the maximum time for the blood to be near air, collect oxygen, and then get rid of carbon dioxide. After passing through the lung and now repleted in oxygen, the blood is delivered to the left atrium by the pulmonary vein. 
Okay, now let's move to the left side of the heart. The left atrium accumulates oxygenated blood from the lungs, and then every time the heart beats, it fills the left ventricle. The left side of the heart is part of the high pressure, high flow circulatory system. And the left ventricle does an incredible amount of work. At rest, the heart beats about 80 minutes per minute in normal people. And the left ventricle pumps against not three to eight millimeters of mercury, but against 120 to 140 millimeters of mercury, the normal systolic blood pressure. The left ventricle delivers blood to the largest and most powerful blood vessels you have, the aorta. Immediately after leaving the left ventricle, the aorta branches into the ascending and descending aortas. They're called ascending and descending because one branch carries blood upward and the other branch carries it downward. The ascending aorta supplies blood to the brain primarily, and it does that through two arteries, one on each side of the neck, the carotid arteries. The descending aorta is the aorta that supplies blood and therefore oxygen and nutrients to all other peripheral tissues other than the lung. It is the largest and most muscular and powerful artery in the body and has to be because it must support easy, rapid blood flow at high pressure. So this brings us to key point number one. Your heart is two-sided because you have two circulatory systems, the pulmonary and the peripheral circulatory systems. And those two circulatory systems differ. The atria are responsible for assuring that ventricles are filled with blood prior to each heartbeat. The ventricles are the big pumps. Which brings us to key point number three. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs against 3 to 8 millimeters of mercury, while the left ventricle pumps blood to peripheral tissues against 120 to 140 millimeters of mercury. Consequently, the left ventricle is the chamber in the heart that does the most work, uses the most nutrients and the most oxygen, and is therefore the site where most heart attacks happen. Don't forget, of course, that the heart is an organ and it consumes vast quantities of oxygen and nutrients and because it needs that to do the work it does. Thus, there has to be a circulatory system for the heart, to the heart, and that circulatory system is critical. Left anterior descending artery, or LAD, supplies most of the blood to the left ventricle. Thus, a blockage of the LAD is called the Widowmaker because blockage of the LAD is far, far too often fatal, causing a fatal heart attack. I think the next question you probably might wonder about is, why does the heart beat rhythmically? Now, you know that in most humans, the heart beats quite regularly, and it beats quite regularly all your life. Most things in your body are simple, and if you think a little bit about them, easy to understand. The reason the heart beats rhythmically is that there is a metronome that sets the rhythm and an electrical circuit that delivers a current regularly throughout the heart to stimulate contraction and relaxation of the heart muscle. You already know that all organs are comprised of cells of various types and that the cells have plasma membranes. The plasma membrane of most cells is electrically very stable and in fact carries a fairly significant negative electric charge. Cells that are responsible for generating electrical current, such as the neurons in your brain or the electrical systems of the heart are different. They have systems that make the plasma membrane electrically unstable. The electrical current is generated by moving positively and negatively charged ions across the membranes. So an electric current generating cell produces a signal. It has undergone what is called depolarization, meaning 
that it has transported ions, sodium, potassium, for example, across the membrane in such quantities that it is no longer negatively charged, but neutral. But, of course, the next step must be to depolarize the membrane again and return the cell back to its normal state in which it's negatively charged on the outside of that membrane. And that cycle is called depolarization, repolarization. So the metronome and the cells that carry the current, causing the heart to beat rhythmically, are like neurons and rhythmically, electrically unstable. The metronome of the heart is called the sinoatrial node or SA node. That just means that is a little area of cells in the atrium and these cells undergo the most rapid depolarization and repolarization cycles. They are the current generators and the current then travels uh, through the heart as though it were in an electrical wire. The electrical wire cells of the heart are called the Purkinje system, named after the scientists who discovered it. It's great if you discover something in science, you get your name associated with it. I think that's way better and cheaper than um, you know getting building a building and getting your name on it. The SA node beats more rapidly than is comfortable for the ventricles because they have to have time to fill and pump blood against real pressure. To slow the electrical current a little bit, you have another little group of cells in the left ventricle called the AV node, atrial ventricular node, the node that connects the electrical current from the atria to the ventricles. And you can think of the AV node in a normal heart as a bit of a yellow light that slows the traffic down but doesn't stop it. Of course, you must be able to adjust your heart rate and blood pressure constantly, depending on what you are physically doing, from sleeping to running for your life. That is why the heart, like all organs, has nerves that control it. These nerves that control organs like the heart, blood vessels, GI tract, are called autonomic nerves because they work without your having to think about it at all. You can contrast that with things like motor nerves that you control. You move your hand when you want to move your hand. It doesn't move on its own unless you have a problem. Those are active nerves as opposed to autonomic nerves. Like most things in the body, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two arms that often have opposing effects so that you can manage very fine control of your various organs without thinking. One arm of the autonomic nervous system is the adrenergic system. It is called the adrenergic system because at the end of those nerves, they secrete epinephrine or norepinephrine, which you know is adrenaline or noradrenaline. The other arm is called cholinergic because those nerves secrete acetylcholine. Actually, the SA node would normally be quite a bit faster were it not controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Specifically, the cholinergic nerves that secrete acetylcholine, which reduce the pace of the membrane depolarization and repolarization of the SA nodal cells. The adrenergic system can take over and make the SA node even more unstable, making the heart beat faster. So you have two systems that can be used to slow or increase the heart rate as needed. The autonomic nervous system also controls blood pressure. For simplicity, the adrenergic system causes the big arteries to contract, raising blood pressure, and the cholinergic system causes those arteries to dilate, causing the blood pressure to drop. So the so-called fight-or-flight reflex is exactly that. When you feel threatened, Your heart beats faster and your blood pressure rises to give you all the blood you need to run or fight for your life. At the same time, the autonomic nervous system assures that you don't have to stop to urinate or defecate while you're running for your life. All of that is done through the autonomic nervous system. 
This brings us to key point number four. The Purkinje system can, constitutes the electrical system of the heart and controls how fast the heart beats. Key point number five. The SA node is the metronome of the heart. Left to its own devices, it would cause the heart to beat faster were it not controlled by the cholinergic nerve fibers in the autonomic nervous system. The cholinergic system causes the heart to slow and blood pressure to be reduced most of the time. The adrenergic system causes the heart to beat faster and stronger and increases your blood pressure. Of course, the main job of the heart is to pump blood, and obviously you generate an electric current rhythmically, so your heart can pump blood rhythmically. This brings us finally, then, back to the main job of the heart, pumping blood. The right side of the heart has a pretty easy job because it only pumps against a low pressure of 3 to 8 millimeters of mercury. After the right atrium fills the right ventricle, the blood, the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery quickly divides into tiny little capillaries that are distributed evenly into little units of the lung called alveoli. You can think of these as tiny little sacs of air surrounded by a very thin membrane of lung cells. To each of these little sacs, an alveola, a capillary is distributed. The architecture here is critical. You must have a capillary associated with each alveola because the job of these alveoli is to collect oxygen from air and get rid of carbon dioxide to the air you breathe out. Because the pulmonary blood pressure is low, the flow of blood is slow enough to allow all this to take place. The blood then heads to the left atrium. During diastole, the time when the ventricles are not contracted, the left atrium fills the left ventricle, and then the ventricle contracts, pushing blood into the systemic circulatory system. Remember that this is a high pressure, high flow system you know that you have a systolic and diastolic blood pressure. All that means is your blood pressure when the heart is contracted, which is normally 120 to 140 millimeters of mercury, and your blood pressure when the heart is relaxed, which is normally 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury. Now you know what systolic and diastolic actually mean. You now know that the functions of the heart are twofold to beat steadily and rhythmically, and to contract and pump blood. The process of beating steadily and rhythmically is called chronotropic function of the heart, chrono, time, tropic function, beating regularly as directed by the metronome of the heart, the SA node. And the second function then is to generate the force necessary to pump blood throughout the body. That is called inotropic functions. I know, force, tropic, function. Obviously, these two functions are intertwined. The heart must beat rhythmically to assure that the ventricles are full of blood when they contract, but diseases of the heart can affect the rhythm of the heart or the force that the ventricles can generate. However, a failure to beat rhythmically affects the pumping ability of the heart and an inability to generate the force necessary to contract will certainly alter the rhythm. Key point number six then, cardiac output is the best measure of how the heart is doing in meeting its primary responsibility of delivering sufficient blood to all tissues. The key determinants of cardiac output are the rate at which the heart beats and the force of contraction of left ventricle. And Lorem is a nonprofit committed to discovering and providing personalized experimental treatments for free for life to patients with genetic diseases that affect 1 to 30 patients worldwide, referred to by Enlorem as nano rare. 
Many of these patients progress and die without ever achieving a diagnosis. This is where Enlorum comes in. They do the impossible by providing hope and for those that they can help, free lifetime treatment. For more information about Enlorum or today's episode, visit enlorum.org. Any questions can be sent into podcast at enlorum.org. Search Enlorum on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook to connect with us. Please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allows others to find the show. This podcast is hosted by Dr. Stan Crook. Our videographer is John Magnuson of Mighty One Productions. Our producers are John Magnuson and Kira Deneen of DNA Today. Thank you for listening.